Hello. Pretty weak. Hello. Much better, much better. So I'm very excited to be here because this is actually my first time being at Channel Partners. And I've walked away with two impressions over the last two days. Number one, it's a fairly impressive operation. So I just wanted to do a call out to Laura and I and to Jessica and all the folks that have really put this uh, wonderful event together. Let's give them a round of applause here. The second thing is this. Um, I'm a newbie. And I don't know about you guys, the first time you came to a Channel Partners event, but this is my reaction. I was freaking overwhelmed. This morning, I was sitting through uh, one of the IoT presentations by AT&T, and they eloquently kind of talked about the opportunity, and they used the word exponential growth. Well, guess what? Exponential growth is what you guys eat every single day. You know, when I look out and see what you guys are facing, what you guys are doing, how you're changing the world, I would say you guys are like the cowboys and cowgirls of this new economy. You know, you're kind of creating the wild, wild west. And that's exciting, but it's also hard to navigate. Because as you are just getting up to speed on one technology and one capability, boom, another shiny object kind of throws its way at you, right? And kind of sort of sparkles. What do you do then? So a little overwhelming in terms of all the opportunities that are available to you. I think the other thing is, by the way, click here, okay. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is I went to the booth last night. And I went around and I kind of tried to absorb all of it. There was a lot of sales slogans and a lot of acronyms. And again, I was struck by the idea, I was overwhelmed. Really overwhelmed. I felt like, man, I have to learn a new language. I'm not a techie. And this is even harder than Mandarin. And I know Mandarin. And this is much harder, guys. Okay? So, by the way, of all the slogans last night that I saw that were really impressive, that really stood out, that were distinctive, was this one. Go visit them. They're at the very far left corner of the exhibit hall. I might need it. Who knows? Anyway, so this idea of being overwhelmed by being presented with a lot of opportunities and the idea of so many different sales ideas, so many different acronyms, so many different reasons to believe and sort of buy into this industry. The question for you all is this. How do you stand out versus all this noise? And on top of that, this is really critical. Because you guys are going to pivot. You're going to adjust as the industry adjusts. You need to be agile. But how do you remain timelessly relevant with each pivot to the customers who love you? So that all of a sudden you're, you're not a flash in the pan or you become somebody they don't know or don't understand. Because those are the elements really required to become iconic. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is how you guys can build iconic businesses. Maybe not on a global scale, but for the niche, for the customers that you service. How do you become known for something that stands for a benefit that you uniquely deliver? So Craig mentioned this idea. Yes, I've been very fortunate. $2 billion. That's a pretty big number. But there's a couple things hidden in this number. First, I didn't do it all. There was a bunch of teams. In fact, I'm taking a credit for a lot of different people that made this happen. But what I can take credit for is there were a lot of mistakes, a lot of failures, a lot of experiments that actually led to a lot of embarrassment. Bottom line, a lot of carnage to get to $2 billion. And one of the reasons I'm writing this book was I saw that other companies were much more effective at innovation than I was. And just to clarify and set, to sort of level set credibility around this idea of failure, I have a scorecard on my own personal failures. So number four, I've had four career restarts. I know you guys are thinking, big deal, career restarts. Guys, you guys switch jobs every two years, 18 months, 12 months, who knows? But this, these career restarts were always predicated by the idea that I had six to 12 months of unemployment begging for somebody to either hire me or fund my new crazy idea. That's what I meant by career restarts. And that was often the result of this idea. I just wasn't very successful at starting new businesses. I had five businesses dissolve. Now, all this is fine, but actually this next number is probably one of the hardest numbers to swallow. By having all these restarts and businesses dissolved, 
I've had to sit across from people that I got on board with this great vision and basically say to them, we've been doing this a year, two years, maybe even three. And guess what? I don't think we're going to make payroll next week. And I'm not sure how you're going to pay for junior school. Those are tough conversations to have. Talk about failure. Bottom line, the result of all this, I've had over 30 product failure launches, just horrible launches where we spent millions of dollars. All right, this next number looks really big. But I'm telling you, it's actually really small. Can anyone guess what this number is? Anyone? So, 300, it's the basement. It's like when you take your SAT, you automatically get 600 points by just putting your name on the top of the SAT test, okay? 300 is actually even worse than getting 600 in SAT. Here's why. The minute you put your name into the database, the minute you get one of those social security numbers and you get a credit score, it sets at 600. You have to do a lot of bad stuff to get down to 300, okay? And by the way, less than 0.1% of the uh, US population has ever achieved this number. And I'm so lucky because I've done it twice. Okay, so if you think you're a better failure than me, let's talk afterwards. I'd love to exchange some notes. So, obviously this idea of being a big failure was sort of burning deep in my head. And I was trying to figure out how might I and others not have to fail as much as I did in order to get new ideas, in order to create business impact in the world easier. And as I investigated over 50 different companies, we benchmarked over 50 different companies, companies like Apple, like BMW, companies like Nike, they were doing it so differently than I was doing it. So I kind of want to figure that out. So what I did is this. First, I kind of tried to go back to some basic business ideas. You've all seen this idea from Michael Porter, right? These are the two generic strategies that most businesses can pursue. You either go after cost leadership or differentiation. And I worked at VF, Craig mentioned this, large apparel company, 30 different brands, North Face, Vans, Timberland, Seven for Mankind, Splendid, Ella Moss, you, I could go on, right? But the issue is this, on these two spectrums, we were getting attacked. So when it came to cost leadership, you guys all shopped at Zara, the H&Ms, and the Uniglo's of the world. We have 1,500 retail locations. We can't compete with these guys. Why? They were able to make the same thing we made at half the cost, and here's the kicker, at one-tenth the time. Plus, they were much more relevant and current to the current needs of the consumer because they had a pulse on that. Wow, that was really hard to compete on a cost leadership point of view. And then when it came to the idea of being differentiation or creating differentiation, we were being out differentiated. Every single month, new business models were coming out that challenged the way consumers thought about value, about system delivery, about how to create ecosystems and how to interact with brands. We had a hard time keeping up with all that. So on one end, whoa, we were getting nipped at cost. On the other end, we we're being out-differentiated by all this new business model innovation. Yes, we're a $13 billion company, so what did we do? We hire very expensive consultants. And I don't want to knock anyone who's a very expensive consultant, because, because you're probably worth it, okay? But what did they tell us to do? Well, of course, we brought them in, and they said, you need to innovate or die. You need to get on that next S-curve and find that game changer. Any of you ever heard those buzzwords before? Okay, yes. So that's what we did. That was my job. You know, I spent seven years doing that and had some success. But like I said, I had a lot of carnage. And here's the issue when you are given this type of advice. Innovate or die. You know, go down that new S curve. Find that game changer. It leads to this sort of mindset. This is the gross share matrix by BCG, Boston Consulting Group. You may be familiar with this. But the philosophy I'm sure you've all heard, you have these cash cows, whether they be products in your portfolio, services that you provide that you make extra heavy margin on, that have been around, the heritage part of your business. And what do you do with those? You milk those cows, and you feed those shiny innovation stars. You've all heard this idea, right? 
That's what I did. That's what our whole organization did. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 plus years. But guess what? When I benchmarked these 50 companies that were doing it differently, they, told, they took a totally different tact. Instead of just milking their cows, they buttered them up. And instead of just chasing after shiny new objects, they actually innovated the old. They innovated where they were already strong, where they were already well known for, well liked, well received, where they already had capabilities, whether it be manufacturing or service delivery or talent, where they already had channels of distribution and customers dying to buy their product. They focused on innovating there, not on the shiny new stuff. And boy, that was kind of, that was kind of an aha moment for me. Well, why would you do that? It's really simple logic. See, when you go after shiny new objects, this is where you're at in the spectrum, right? The likelihood of success and the, the level of complexity or cost, this is the quadrant you'll compete in. But if you innovate where you're already strong, where already you have customers, where you already have momentum, and you bring all the idea of shiny new objects against where you're already strong, this is the quadrant you will live in. And going back to Porter's model, okay? Well, if you already have a certain degree of momentum, of history, of experience, innovating your strength, guess what? You probably already have a cost advantage versus a lot of different people. And by continually focusing on innovating there, you're going to enhance your cost, cost leadership there. And when it comes to differentiation, if you're innovating on your strength and continuing to build the gap between you and the competition, you build greater differentiation. And that leads to sustainable competitive advantage. You can have your cake and eat it too. Wow, what a concept. $2 billion, where I probably, I probably spent $3 billion trying to get to $2 billion. It's almost like being in Hollywood. So this was sort of the aha moment for me. And here's the other thing. This is the idea about differentiation. It wasn't just any type of differentiation. It's iconic differentiation. It means that you're a standard bearer for a benefit in a category, a niche, in a vertical that you compete in. How can you accomplish that, and what's the value of that? Well, think about this type of differentiation. Imagine getting a set of these on your first job interview versus having a big pen. The quiet confidence it gives you. You may never even pull out that pen, but just knowing that you had that, knowing your parents actually bought that for you, it gives you a boost of confidence. Iconic products also help identify who we are and what we believe in. By the way, my wife is totally a Burke. But I know people, actually, I went to visit Tori Burke, a uh, Birch. No, she's a Birch, sorry. I went to visit Tori Birch, and I asked them, are you guys Burks or Birch? And guess what they told me? A lot of them are both. It depends on their mood, on their occasion. But that's the thing about iconic products. You know, one minute you could be driving a Harley, the next minute you could be driving a Vespa. Depends on your mood and what, what you want to represent that moment. That's the power of having iconicity. And iconic products, hell, they can even make us feel good when we don't feel so good. That is the power of iconic products, because here's the thing with iconic products. They go beyond what we see, even what we rationalize, or even what we feel to a place of belief, of faith, because they represent who we are and what we believe about ourselves when we use them and what we want others to think about us when we use iconic products. I argue this, based on all this research, those people that focus on building iconic status within their organizations, within their service offerings, and within their products, they actually have the highest level of profitability within the organization. That is the highest form of profitability, is to reach iconic status. And that's what you guys should be striving for when you guys are dealing with your customers. Are you known for something special that makes people remember you? So, the book outlines the ways that you can achieve iconic status based on all these learnings. The first question we wanted to answer in order to pull this all apart and reverse engineer all this is, what the hell is iconicity and what makes certain things iconic? Well, guess what? When we looked across the board, whether it be services, products, you know, uh, new startups or old businesses, there were three qualities that seemed to be fairly consistent for iconic products and businesses. The first is this, there is something distinctive about that business or that product. And the other element that's really important, it's not just different for different sake. 
the distinction is highly relevant, it's meaningful. And th the key here is that it's not just relevant in the past or today, but it's timelessly relevant. And only by being timelessly relevant for what's distinctive can you reach iconic status. The third element is required, and that is obviously being universally recognized for that distinction that is highly relevant to people. That probably is the easiest of the three to accomplish. The first two are a little bit more difficult. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So how do you, knowing that these are the three main qualities that, most, that all iconic franchises and businesses and services share, how can you supercharge those? So the framework lays out three different ways and three different focus areas that you need to build greater power. The first is this, noticing power. As you guys look at your business, do you stand out? Are you distinctive? Do people remember you? And are you focused on having them remember one simple thing about you? The next is, is what you are distinctive, is that relevant, and are you keeping it relevant? Are you investing in making that relevant and making it timelessly relevant? And lastly, are you scaling it? Scaling in a way that more and more people know you within the niche, the vertical, the, the place that you compete. So let's go into noticing power, and I'm gonna share a story. There was a NASA engineer by the name of, I love his name, M, M. Frank Rudy. And he was actually in charge of designing helmets, okay? And really protecting the head from head trauma. And he came up with this system of actually putting air pockets into the helmet to protect against head trauma. And he had the brilliant idea of saying, boy, if that could be good for the head, what might it do for the feet? So again, this was in the 1960s. He went around, shopped at a whole bunch of apparel companies. I'm sure he came to VF, and I'm sure we said no. But he finally found one company out of, I think he went to 12 different companies that said, you know what, we might be interested in this. And I'm sure you guys know the rest is sort of history, but let me give you a little background on the history. Nike purchased the idea, but here's their first execution of it. Is there a problem with this? Do you know there's an air pocket there? It's hard to know that, right? There's no distinctive quality about that. That shoe looked like every other shoe in the 1980s, okay? And obviously, they went back to the drawing board, and the only way you actually knew there was an air pocket in there is with a hang tag or the POS sign, and quite frankly, when you ask consumers about it, they thought it was kind of gimmicky. But the next breakthrough happened here. They brought it back to the labs, and they told the designers, you know what, we have a, a unique feature. Can you make it immediately obvious so we don't even need a hang tag? And can it communicate the benefit, and can it look beautiful? And this is what they came up with. And I'm looking around the audience, I think you guys are roughly my age, maybe a little younger, that's fine. So you guys remember when this came out, okay? Right now this looks kind of boring, but back in 1987, when it showed up on the shelf, it was groundbreaking. It really stood out. Here's what I did. When I saw it, I walked up to it, I picked it up, I squeezed it kind of back and forth, I poked at it, and here's the other thing I did, I smelled it, like as if it was off gas or something, okay? What a brilliant insight. Not only is this a distinctive feature, but it's highly relevant. Think about this. The average trainer loses 40% of its support in its life. But a pocket of air would never lose its buoyancy. Brilliant. So that is a distinctive feature that's highly relevant. Now, in the book, we actually talk about 10 different ways that you can create distinction. Here's just a few. But one of the ones I want to focus on is the idea of experience. Do you guys have distinctive experiences that you deliver that make you stand out? Is there a magic moment that you guys create when you, do, when you map out the customer journey? Is there a pivotal moment that you guys over-index that you can point to in the delivery? Is there something about your product that provides a feature? And when you think about how you brand, is there a certain style that's fairly consistent? Anyway, we don't have time today to go through all those, but I just wanted to share that one of the questions you need to ask yourself is there's a lot of options to create distinction. How are you guys going about that? So let's go to noticing power, uh, staying power. So on staying power, I'm gonna stick with the Nike example. This is a map, sort of the histogram, of 30 years of the Nike Air. And the question is, how the hell have they kept this timelessly relevant for 30 years? And what can we learn that we can apply to our businesses as we think about keeping our businesses relevant? Well, the first thing they did is they protected the signature elements. Really only two things, the swoosh and the air pocket. 
but they made sure those were consistent. Whatever generation, whatever iteration, that was always there. Why? Because when we buy into an iconic franchise we like, when we buy into an iconic brand or service that we like, we want to know there's a certain degree of familiarity, like seeing an old friend. That is important. We don't want them to also show up and they're totally somebody we don't know. The other thing they did is they evolved their story. They didn't stay in the same place. They continue, continually grew. A good analogy of this is, we all know, by the way, the, the reason you do that is it creates meaning. And a good, a good, good analogy for this is one of my favorite childhood books, Tintin. We all know Tintin. He's pretty much the same guy in every single book. But the adventures, the places in the world he goes to, and what he learns, and how he grows, and how he experiences it, it's interesting, it's fascinating, it's story, but the person and the archetype is always the same. And the same is true for your businesses. How are you telling your story about your organs, about what you guys are doing? What's your vision? Because people want to hear that. They don't want to just hear that you're the low-cost provider. The other thing they did is they didn't just rest on their laurels. I talked about this earlier. They innovated the old. They took the air pocket, and they expanded it beyond just the heel to the sole to the whole shoe, and they kept going at it, and the people like, was it the Reebok pump and other people who tried to copy them, they couldn't catch up. Nike kept this going, because when you do that, you maintain the light. Consumers get bored quickly. You need to keep that dopamine high, right? And so they kept doing that. And lastly, they needed to create this tension of both being familiar, but being new. That's what makes people excited about being part of an iconic franchise and brand and service, is that there's an element of it being very familiar, but an element of it being kind of surprising and fun, because that creates excitement. So at the end of the day, Nike did all these four things to remain relevant. And guess what? They continually do this. This is an active, active, deliberate part of their strategy. They have people against this, they have structures, and they have best practices, all against delivering these things. What are you doing to protect your familiarity? As you go into a new vertical, as a new space, what is it that consumers still and customers still going to know about you? How are you keeping the meaning, the delight, and the excitement fresh? Those are things you need to think about in terms of building staying power. So lastly, on scaling power. OK. Share a story of Mini. It came out in the 1960s, and in 1960, it was pretty cool, right? Very distinctive. It really fit the time of London back then. It was kind of the Austin Powers era, and this kind of style worked out perfectly. But here's the issue. It went out of business in the 90s, 30 years later, and the last car that came off the production line pretty much looked just like that. They never once really upgraded the design. It was very distinctive, so it had great noticing power, but they didn't focus on the idea of staying power. So what happened? Thank God, BMW bought them out of bankruptcy. And BMWs, they're masters at the idea of iconic management. You know, the three series, the five series, seven series, the new i series. And this is the first thing they did. They didn't jump right to going to scaling power. They went back and thought about what is the noticing power and what do we need to do on staying power. By the way, looking at that, I call it the avocado. When we work with a lot of startups, a lot of businesses, a lot of services, I ask the people in the workshop, put a post-it for your top five priorities and then put it against that avocado. And guess what? 80 plus percent of the activities are around the outer circle of marketing, distributing, getting the word of the brand. Very little of it is about how do we maintain our distinction and keep it relevant. So that's just a cautionary note. Well, BMW didn't jump right to scaling. No. First thing they did is they looked at this Mini and said, what about it is so distinctive? What about it is special? Well, part of it is the sort of, it looks like a face. And in fact, to the design team, it resembled a face of a child. It was playful. It was eager. It was alert. The other thing they did is when they looked at this, they said it kind of looks like a stacked hamburger. And in fact, this idea of a stacked hamburger became part of their iconic brand language. In fact, they identified six different areas about how they would maintain their noticing power and built it into the mini. And that's how they protected its noticing power. The next thing they did is they upped the staying power. They made it relevant for the times, the power, the comfort, the style. Knowing those two things were in place, they then could go to scaling. And scaling is really simple. 
It's taking your iconic brand language and extending it into further products and services, into new verticals, into new areas. It's also obviously creating awareness through marketing and making sure it's available to people so that they can purchase. And the more they use it, obviously, they become billboards for you. So how did Mini and BMW go about doing this? Well, because they had a strong iconic brand language, it wasn't that hard to create a station wagon, a convertible. I think you guys have seen the new Countryman, not my favorite execution, but does still look like a Mini. They even took that iconic brand language and put it into accessories and luggage so that when people were traveling or when they're on the go, they were still communicating the Mini brand and still part of the Mini franchise. They took the iconic brand language and infused it into how they did the marketing, the quirky, the fun, the playful. You can see that through their marketing and even showed up in their distribution. So that is the key when you think about scaling. And let me, let me explain something about scaling. The universe of scaling can be what you define it to be. It doesn't have to be the whole world. It doesn't have to be global. It could be four pizza joints in San Francisco's North Beach. I want to be the best known pizza place in that region for those customers coming in. And I don't care about tourists. I just want to care about local people because they'll tell the tourists, right? That's what I mean about you choose your iconicity. It doesn't have to be broad. It can be very narrow. But you want to be distinctive and relevant and scale within that small universe so that you have sort of, you become the standard bearer for that small universe. So I want to share one last story with you. I know this is a very product-heavy presentation. But this idea of building iconic brands also applies to services. So let's talk about Amazon. When Amazon first came out, I think we all knew them, what, for books, right? Low cost, high availability of books, and then eventually it spread beyond that. But guess what? Today, there are actually other websites, Alibaba, eBay, where you can find stuff that's not on Amazon. So it's not all about availability. And if you really want, you can find things anywhere from 2 to 5% cheaper somewhere else in the World Wide Web. So they're not always the cheapest. They're close, but they're not always the cheapest. That's not what they're hanging their hat on. No. Where they want to own an iconic benefit and become a standard bearer is around this idea, one click. That's where they're going. That's what Amazon wants to stand for. How have they sort of evolved one click? Well, now you can have instantaneous downloads not only of books, music, and videos, but you can have same-day delivery. Oh, wait. You can also actually have, in the physical world, buttons that you push that gives you same-day delivery, right? You guys have probably seen these dash buttons. You can put them on your, for these, you'd put it on your washing machine. You can have them on your fridge. You can have them on your sofa where you want your Lay's potato chip. And we're talking about this idea of same-day delivery of fresh produce, not just a packaged produce. This is where they're going. And guess what? You guys think Amazon's a website. No way. They don't care to be a website anymore. In fact, they're going to uh, they're going to shortcut the idea of websites because you're going to be able to talk into whatever it is and basically order whatever you want whenever you want. The website's sort of an old idea. Here's what I believe. Someday they're going to have implants in our head and we're going to they're going to basically know before we ever know we want it and it's going to show up. All right. By the way, I don't know if you guys have seen this commercial, but this is all about the idea of same-day delivery. Here's what they really want to own. This is the benefit that Amazon has been relentless about, and it's this. They want to own the idea of no patience required. So one of the things about innovating the old, this is one of the catches, but this is true for all the companies we looked at. They were willing to own the category benefit that they were known for in such a way that they were willing to cannibalize themselves for it. How do you set up a structure where you have a heritage business that's producing all this cash that is important? The president of that business is probably has the largest revenue, the largest profit, the largest organization, and basically tell that person, in five years, we have a plan to obsolete you. But these organizations are set up just like that. Because they're innovating against a strength they own in a category where they're the standard bearer. That's the type 
of strategy that's required in order to build iconicity. You can't stand still. And you guys understand that better than anybody. So I want to leave you with just one thought today. It's this. Yes, are you focused on noticing power, staying power, and scaling power? Sure, OK. But more important than that, just start with this one simple question. What's your signature? I went to the booths last night. I talked to probably 10 different organizations. Some were sort of in the kind of hardware phone area. Others were sort of service providers, integrators, and some were network guys. But let's just roughly call those three categories. When I talked to like competitors, I walked away thinking, God, sounds like the same pitch. Everyone's end to end, turnkey. No one's transactional. They're all relational. They're going to empower my business. A lot of buzzwords, a lot of platitudes. One of the questions I ask myself is, how is this company different than that company? Because they all will say the same thing. True, some of them do it better than others. Some have just started it. They're not telling me that. Others have been doing this a long time. But I don't know. And guess what? I don't know what really distinguishes this one from the other one. So the question for you guys is, what's your signature? And more importantly, in order to do a litmus test on that, if you just took five, three, pick three of your customers and called them up and said, hey, what are we known for? What do you like about us? Would all three of them, wait, would hopefully all three of them might have an answer, OK? But would it be the same answer? Because if you're known for this on that and that for that and oh, we're everything to everybody, guess what? That's spreading a lot of peanut butter really thin. If you're going to spread peanut butter, make it thick, make it chunky, guys, right? If you're going to pull three of your customers, make sure they say the same thing. That's point one. Point two, make sure it's important to them. It's relevant to them. It's something that they care about. And point three, make sure you're over-delivering on it to the point where they can't wait to tell somebody else about it. That's your job today, guys. Make sure you're clear on what your signatures are. Go out and ask three of your customers and see if they say the same thing. Work on that, and then you will become iconic. Thank you guys very much.